This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers, brought to you by the Fur Bearers. Wildlife rehabilitators are incredible people. They dedicate their time, personal or professional, to assisting wild animals who are injured or orphaned. It takes a lot to successfully navigate the provincial bureaucracies, fundraising, administration, and volunteer wrangling, let alone actually caring for the animals. I regularly stand in awe of such individuals, and as such, am thrilled to connect with Bonnie Dell, Executive Director of the Wildlife Rescue Society of Saskatchewan. Bonnie joins Defender Radio to share the story of the Wildlife Rescue Society of Saskatchewan, the challenges faced on a daily basis in providing care for Saskatchewan's wildlife, and how people can support WRSOS, their local rehabilitator, and get involved. Let's start out by talking a bit about Wildlife Rescue Society of Saskatchewan and yourself, Bonnie, and what the story is. How, how did we get to where we are today in kind of large movements? <laughs> well, the Wildlife Rescue Society of Saskatchewan was originally started in 2006 as the Wildlife Rehabilitation Society of Saskatchewan by a group of like-minded people who saw the need in this province to start uh, the movement of rehabilitating wildlife. And they felt that by starting a provincial hotline, it would help the few wildlife rehabbers that were in the province at that time by allowing callers to be vetted over the telephone instead of them bringing animals in to rehabbers that maybe shouldn't be coming in. Mm -hmm. So that's where it all started. It was it was slow. It was a slow, quiet movement and group at the time. When I joined in 2017, we were getting about 1,200 calls a year, and last year we were over 5,000. So it's it's seen some some monumental growth in the past few years. Absolutely. And just looking quickly at the website, um, you've got statistics up on the What We Do page, and it's very nicely laid out for folks. But the quick stats from the year 20, uh, 2020 to 21 year were 4,691 calls to the wildlife hotline, 303 communities across Saskatchewan were helped, 226 active volunteers were located across the province in 76 different communities, and 200 different species of wildlife were helped. It's uh, an impressive number, um, not only just in terms of the, the help that's provided and how incredible it is, but then the scope of the logistics of what you're doing in one of the provinces in our country that is arguably the most spread out in terms of populace. No, it is, you know, it, we're serving one point billion people and it is a vast, vast province um, for 650,000 square miles. And we have the most hardworking volunteers. Some of them drive uh, thousands and thousands of kilometers every year transporting wildlife to the few centers that we have in the province. We don't have a lot of rehabbers. We only have four throughout the province who take all species. And then we have just a handful who specialize in bats or raccoons. So it puts a lot of pressure on just those four bigger all species centers. Putting that into context for folks, again, just trying to pull up the current numbers, which is never easy on Google when you're talking to someone. Uh, <laughs> but the, the population of Saskatchewan in 2022 is 1.18 million. And for context, that's the entire province of Saskatchewan. The estimated population of the city of Toronto is 7 million. So just to give people the idea of the difference in scale because i think that can be hard for those of us coming from the larger cities of there's still a lot of people there but it's really well spread out and the lifestyle there as you've noted is likely a lot different too with more folks working in agriculture horticulture and various other resources um do you find that impacts what wildlife rescue society of saskatchewan does that there's maybe a different kind of culture surrounding wildlife or people's uh, uh, expectations Oh, a hundred percent. The biggest thing that we do is we help the so-called nuisance and pest animals. That's how they're termed in an agricultural mm -hmm. province. And that's that's who we help, who we are called to help. 
And it's, I think it's a testament to the fact that the province is ready for change when you see how many calls we get. And people are invested in wildlife. They love wildlife in this province. And we're slowly in roads with that rural population because your grandpa poisoned and killed everything doesn't mean we have to do that. Yeah. And we're getting more and more and more calls. We get the odd caller who phones and tells us that they have an injured coyote on their property, but coyotes are essential to their their farm, to their crops, they, their good rodent control. So we are seeing a shift in that definitely. But the, just the scope of it, to be able to get out to every rural um, caller that we get, you should hear some of the directions we get. You know, it's <laughs> down the road and left at the big tree, and yeah. then you'll see a gray roof on your right. So even finding it can be hard. And, and we've, we're trying to work through better directions and, <laughs> and using land locations more. Yes, and, and you're also dealing with uh, uh, significant weather in Saskatchewan. I think that's another thing folks forget is... Um, you know, if you haven't spent any time there, you don't realize you get a heavy winter. You get cold and you get hot and things can change real quick with those great big open fields. Um, so there's oh, challenges in that way. Dealing with, always dealing with wind on the, on the prairies as well. And yes, we do go from one extreme to the next throughout the year. And it makes uh, transportation and, and rescues difficult. There are so many storms and times that we have to simply say to callers that we cannot send a volunteer out, it's just far too dangerous. And yeah. that's when we've got really good, we're very good at talking callers into helping the animal themselves. Well, and I think that's, uh, you, you talk a lot about this on the website, and I think it's something a lot of rehabilitators uh, try and deal with. And you even noted that you uh, kind of, you work as a triage on the phone system with other rehabbers and sort of prevent calls from maybe going forward that don't need to go forward. What, I'm trying to think of how to phrase it, um, how do you like to talk to people about sort of the difference between wildlife rehab and stabilizing an animal long enough to get them help? Because I think there is still very much a desire in people to see an injured animal and bring them in and Google how to take care of them and take care of them and then release them on their own, which is legislatively not allowed, but also creates some other issues. So how do you talk through sort of the, the difference between what wildlife rehabilitators and rescue do versus sort of that stabilizing until we can get help triage work the, the general public may be able to do? Well, we have um, we have awesome volunteers who run our helpline, and they can talk callers through pretty much anything, including, you know, we have some of the biggest hawks in the world here in the province of Saskatchewan. They can be quite intimidating. Our volunteers, these no nonsense women, will talk anyone through how to pick that up mm -hmm. and contain it safely. We always tell them to leave it in a dark, quiet spot. And if we can't get someone to them quickly, we put them in touch with our rehabber, Megan Lawrence, who runs Salt Haven West in Regina. And Megan deals with the educating the caller on the proper care instructions for that bird or animal until we can get it. Our best case scenario, though, is that they're able to contain it and we're able to get one of our volunteers. If it has to be kept overnight, that's the best case scenario for. Yeah, I, I think, folks, again, it's you're you're going to be trained, your volunteers are going to be trained in some of the disease management issues, in how to handle some of these animals. Um, you know, I, I have, uh, in my fortunate experiences, I've gotten to transport some wildlife and uh, uh, sort of watch the process of intake at one time on a coyote. And it's amusing to me, or I should say bemusing to me, because you see these animals as these majestic creatures who are powerful and you read these headlines in the media about how terrifying they are. And then you see, uh, um, you know, a, a very petite young person take this coyote out of a carrier and put them on their side and insert an IV and just handle this wild animal with ease and professionalism. 
And it reminds you that they are important animals. They are sentient animals. They are important parts of the ecosystem, but they're still just individuals who have fear, who all of these other things we put on them is just the tip of an iceberg of depth of sort of who they are. And it's such a a thrilling experience to have been able to witness some of that because it helps redefine then how I see the animals. Um, And I I have a deep respect for anyone who does that kind of work. But you you had talked a bit about coyotes, and I'd love to talk more about them because they are one of my favorites as well. I, I got into a lot of this work because of coyotes. And in Saskatchewan, you note that a lot of uh, uh, folks in agriculture recognize the role coyotes play for them. And I think that's so great to hear. Uh, Could you share a bit more about what that's like? We used to be able to rescue and rehabilitate coyotes in the province of Saskatchewan. We did it with 100% success. Um, As you've mentioned so eloquently, Michael, these are all individual animals with their own individual stories and coyotes that that are vilified in the media. People are terrified of them because they're so dangerous. We had no issues with them whatsoever. They were so easy to work with. There was never a negative incident at all. And we did a great job working with them. So we were shocked when the new captive wildlife regulations came into effect in june of 2021 it was the first time the province had revised them since the 80s and they were in desperate need of revision but sadly it left out two things that greatly affected us in our wildlife rescue and rehab world and that is you cannot have education animals in the province and we could no longer rescue or rehabilitate coyotes. So coyotes are deemed nuisance animals in the province. Therefore, conservation officers are not allowed to go out for them should they be injured or orphaned. They can't help them either. So leaves one keystone species in the province that no one is allowed to help legally. So now our instructions are that should we get a call about an injured coyote, we should find the nearest farmer to come out and shoot it, whether it could have been rehabbed or not. So that's the downside of this. The upside is that we work closely Hmm. with the city of Saskatoon and they still happily go out for coyotes. The municipal law overrides the provincial law on this. So... Luckily, here in Saskatoon, we have good people that are humane and will go out and help. And so that's who we rely on locally for coyote calls. But that was a huge disappointment. That and, and not being able to have education animals, which means we can bring in some healthy, non-releasable wildlife, and now we have to euthanize them. And that's really, really sad. Yeah, it's um, a lot of these government choices regarding rehabilitation that I have personally seen are really founded on old game management concept as opposed to actual modern ecology and uh, one health approach to ecosystems and all of that. It's, It's really unfortunate, but I do believe personally that with time, the younger generation coming up in those fields is being taught modern science and the modern science is very, very clear that helping wildlife in these situations, particularly when, uh, it, again, in my experience, the majority of animals who are going into rehab uh, or who require assistance are there because of human activity or in some way adjacent. So whether it's a road strike, a window strike, uh, a trapping mishap, hunting mishap, um, you know, all of these different things that can occur, uh, we have caused. So to me, it is reasonable, uh, if not ethical, uh, ethically necessary to protect and heal when appropriate. And there are a lot of people, yourself included, who have specialized in this and know how to do it. And there's a lot of science that shows we know how to do it successfully. And as you know, you had a great success rate. I know at West and in Ontario, coyotes are rehabilitated uh, um, well and released well and it helps the ecosystem and it helps uh, their social structure but uh, it, it is unfortunate then when we see uh, government choices being made based on special interest or old 
outdated science based on a model of conservation that inherently requires using the animals, the North American model of wildlife conservation. But um, you, you talked about some of the big birds that you get too. And I think that's one of those things people may not realize about Saskatchewan. And again, living in a city, we don't see a lot of large birds. I mean, we do have bald eagles in my area, but you have to go looking for them. And then you start looking, you know, a turkey vulture is probably the largest bird. But the ones we see the most are going to be red-tailed hawks uh, sitting along the highway. Uh, What kind of large animals are you working with uh, in terms of birds at Wildlife Rescue Society? and throughout the province? We rescue an awful lot of hawks. We're going into our raptor season right now uh, where the young are on their own for the first time and it's like teenagers who don't know how to feed themselves (laughs) and they're struggling. And you know, that gets us into an ethical decision too. We have people saying, you know, why are you helping them if they're not meant to survive? Well. We feel we owe it to them. We we cause enough problems for these birds and animals that, that we want to help the ones that we can. So we'll bring them in, fatten them up a bit, and they get released. Uh, we also we have a big golden eagle population in the province. We get turkey vultures as well. That population is really climbing in the province. And we have a lot of cranes, waterfowl. We have a huge waterfowl population and whooping cranes that uh, come through here about this time of year every year. We don't usually get called to rescue any because that would be, I think everyone would be heading out the door to do that (laughs) one. (laughs) But yeah, lots of hawks and owls. Yeah, it's uh, uh, a fascinating, uh, 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 I'm going to come up with the word, meandry, meandry, I can see it in my brain. Menagerie. Menagerie, there it is. I had the E and the A backwards, thank you. (laughs) Uh, a, a delightful menagerie in Saskatchewan. And on your website, you also get to see, uh, I believe, some moose uh, from time to time. But it, I, I think, again, something that people will find interesting is likely the frequency with which you're maybe responding to calls about raccoons and uh, uh, ground squirrels and other animals that are kind of common around the country. Uh, you know, we always like to talk about the big iconic species, <clears throat> excuse me, and we forget about these these little mesopredators and uh, um, uh, sort of lower order wildlife who are integral still, but are, as you said, often categorized as pests. You know, I grew up in Saskatchewan and we didn't see raccoons when I was a kid. I didn't know there were raccoons. So they have moved mm. out west and they now, we get so many calls about them. But the sad thing is the calls are usually in the spring when the mother has been shot and the person that shoots it, it's usually rural find the starving uh, young and can't bring themselves to kill them. So they phone us and we bring them in. And it speaks for itself because we have, you know, the four all species rehabs. but We also have three standalone raccoon rehabbers in the province because that's the volume that that we do take in. And I think it may be surprising to people that this this concept of, oh, well, I see a raccoon, I'm going to shoot it. Again, I think that's a very classic way of thinking in, in a lot of uh, uh, agriculture and horticulture in the world. Um, and again, there's a lot of re-education, I think, that needs to occur. But it's, again, one of these situations where I think it speaks a little bit to a lack of understanding about ecosystems, because if there is one raccoon, there are likely other raccoons, <laughs> particularly in spring, and it is more harmful, ultimately, to to break down the social structure of some of these animals. Um, because, as you said, in, in the case of raccoons, you've got all of these babies who are going to start starving. I know with coyotes and, and some other canids, uh, if the parents are killed too young, they don't learn how to properly forage and hunt. Uh, and that's when you end up having negative encounters at times. Um, it, it is, and I know you're, you're sort of, you're focused on the rescue aspect, but is there a level of sort of gentle education going on with these calls as well? We educate on every single call we get. And I, I would like to rename us you know, the Education Society of Saskatchewan, because we yeah. <laughs> we have the, again, the best 
volunteers who are so knowledgeable and we give out and that's something we pride ourselves on and something we're known for the best education over the phone we don't just run out the door we ask people to send us pictures we discuss normal behavior of wildlife and the statistic that we're most proud of is that we leave most in the wild and we make that decision based on what's best for the animal on our own knowledge and educate the caller and they tend not to phone back then they accept that they you know they've been educated they know that that's a fledgling or that is old enough to be out on its own now because they've sent us a picture and we're able to to explain it to them we also would really really like to get more into the schools and look at doing more educating uh, especially if we could do a little online program is our goal that would be free to teachers that they could show in the classroom and start at a very young age on how to help wildlife and, and the way to help them most of the time is to leave them alone. But this year, and I'm, I'm super excited about this, we were contacted by the Ministry of Education here in the province and they were adding something to the high school curriculum. So here in Saskatchewan, that's grades nine through 12. And it's a brand new program they were calling wildlife management and they wanted our input on it. And we have a fabulous retired high school teacher who lives in a log cabin in Northern Saskatchewan. And she read that curriculum from start to finish. And together we um, approached the government with our ideas and they changed the name to wildlife and habitat studies because as we pointed out they wildlife doesn't need management by us and they put in a whole new module it was very heavily hunting and trapping based because that is huge in this province they reworded some of it with gentler wording and they added in a whole new module from grades nine to 12 on wildlife rescue and rehabilitation. Amazing. And I think that's so important is, I mean, we, we can't expect them to not include hunting and trapping because as you said, that is a, a big part of a lot of people's lives, a lot of people's family history, um, you know, a lot of people's cultures in that part of Canada. And it is here as well. But to include the other side is such a huge step. And, and I mean, just congratulations on that, because it is it's so big to be now at that conversation. And that's how this long term sustainable change happens. I know we all want to bang on the wall until they get rid of the hunting stuff and only have the coexistence stuff. But the reality is this, this is how it happens is we introduce new concepts. And if they are accepted, if they are understood, if we can continue to back them up with good science and ethics, it'll stay. Um, and it is significant, truly, truly significant to be able to get that done. So really, congratulations on that. Oh, it's huge. We were absolutely thrilled. And we are not an, an anti-hunting group. We can't be in this province, but we mm -hmm. stand alongside as a different voice and and we hope as you say that that by working like this with the government and and being the trusted voice for not just the other side but that we're working in partnership that there is another way to do things and that we can work together so i want to talk about people getting involved I, I, there's two elements to this there's one i think a general wildlife rehabilitation if you're interested in it but then we can also talk specifically about wildlife rescue society of saskatchewan opportunities um if, if you know we have an audience member who is interested in doing wildlife rehabilitation or has always loved animals and wants to maybe get more involved wherever they may be how would you suggest folks sort of get into that uh, knowledge base or start that journey by volunteering you have no idea if you want to be a wildlife rehabilitator the best thing to do is to volunteer and if you can't get in with that specific rehab facility then join something like ours which is you know a, a different aspect of it but it would still give you the inside story it, it always looks so much like so much fun all the cute baby animals but until you're in there on the ground you don't realize the the dedication the cost the hours mm -hmm. the frustrations uh so definitely by volunteering that is the best way to get the behind the scenes look 
And for us here, uh, we always need transport volunteers, and I'm sure that's the same throughout the country. If you want to, yeah. you know, see these babies, the animals up close and make a real impact, then that's a really good way to do it where you're not exactly hands-on, but you're still in the facilities, you're still helping just by volunteering to drive, or maybe you drive to and from somewhere for work and you don't mind a passenger or two. That's a really good way to get started. Yeah, I, I have loved doing transportation stuff, uh, both for dog rescue and for wildlife rescue. Um, and one of my favorite stories was taking a... Uh, Oh, I think he was a red-tailed uh, hawk to Toronto Wildlife Center. So from the west end of the city out in Halton region into Toronto, it's, it's only a 45-minute drive on the highway. So I had the, the uh, hawk in the, the transportation box, uh, strapped into the seat, and pull up. And where Toronto Wildlife Center at the time was located was next to a very large event space. So there was constantly events going on. And as such, they'd have police there directing traffic. And I had to go through the event space. So I pulled off and I, I rolled down the window and the officer said, uh, what can, like, what do you need? And I said, well, I'm, I'm delivering wildlife to this facility over here. I need to go down this road. And he goes, oh, that's interesting. Like, do you have any, like, ID or anything? And at that moment, like from a movie horror scene, the, the claw of this hawk comes shooting out through one of the holes <laughs> in the top of the box with a cry. And I have never seen someone jump back so fast. Uh, and then he just from like six feet back said, yep, you're good to go ahead. Thank you. Um, and wave me through. So you get fun stories like that. And you get sometimes to give people a good little jump scare. Um, I also have, uh, uh, you know, great memories of helping wildlife, you know, and then getting to be part of the release, which is always magical uh, when possible. Uh, something you struck on and uh, just a little uh, side note here. There is an emotional cost to this kind of work at times as well. Um, for all of the victories, there can also be a lot of hardships. Do you and your team recommend anything or have anything you like to do or, or ways to sort of manage some of that emotional fallout? I'm really glad you brought that up, Michael, because um, it is something that we are so conscious of in our group because someone once said to me he felt like he was driving a hearse because every animal he had brought in from hours away this is a big burly outdoorsman. He would drive in a little hummingbird to a, to the rehab here in Saskatoon. He would he drives hours for us, and one thing after another died. And he said to me, "I feel like I'm driving a hearse. I really need a win," and that really struck home. And I think that we're one of the only groups I know of. Um, we're very lucky to have free counseling for our volunteers. We have a group of registered wow. psychologists here in Saskatoon. There are three of them who volunteer their time for us. Our volunteers are able to phone them. It is completely confidential. I only know that it has been utilized. I don't know by whom or by how many, but they're able to phone in from anywhere in the province. They're put in touch with their choice of psychologist who will talk to them over the phone or via Zoom to get them through a crisis situation. And just, we are so grateful to them that, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a huge bonus for our volunteers to have that free service available because it can be, it can be soul Incredible. destroying sometimes what you see and what you have to do we have to make life and death yep. decisions sometimes you know is this animal so broken that we take it to a vet to be euthanized or do we take it to a rehab and give it a chance those are tough decisions for animal lovers absolutely and i i, I think even folks who then are adjacent to it and this is something that i am a, a, a little aggressive in bringing up but when you are exposed to that kind of grief on a regular basis, it leads to burnout if you don't manage it. Um, and even if you do manage it, it can still lead to burnout. And that's OK. It just means having people around you who can support you. And it sounds like you've got an incredible team there for your volunteers, both internally and, and through these uh, uh, wonderful psychologists donating their time. Because, again, that is it, it can really bring people down and we lose people in the world of advocacy and wildlife and animal health every year because of burnouts, um, both 
uh, um, you know, from the field and, and unfortunately a uh, number of people who may die by suicide um, and having that kind of support ensures everyone can continue to help not only the animals, but themselves and their greater community. Because if you can't, you know, it's the analogy that animal people often don't appreciate, but you got to keep your gloves up and protect yourselves at all times. Right. It, it, the boxing metaphor works in that regard. If you can't protect yourself, you need to step back and uh, uh, find a way to do that before you get back into it. And what you have there sounds like an excellent system to support that. Well, and there's always the the unwritten pressure of nonprofits that you need to be working 24 seven. If you're not, oh, you're yeah. not passionate yeah. enough. You don't care enough. And we actually have members of the public say that to us. Well, if you cared, you'd be there. And we have actually, yeah. you know, I don't know why there would be an expectation that when you're doing it for free that you owe more to people than if you're getting paid. I don't get mm -hmm. that. So we've looked at that very closely. And we were nine to nine, 365 days a year. And then as we all learned through the pandemic, uh, work isn't everything. And we're now yeah. nine to five, 365 days a year. And it has taken a lot of pressure off of us, off of our volunteers. We leave good instructions on how to keep an animal overnight and it, it will be fine. We can't save everything. And, and we have to look yeah. after our volunteers first and foremost. That is, uh, um to me, a sign of excellent management and leadership, but it is also the thing that separates successful long-term nonprofits from those that don't continue, is that understanding that before any of the work happens, we are human beings and human beings have requirements. Uh, you know, I think it's reasonable at this point to tape up Maslow's hierarchy on the wall sometimes <laughs> as just a reminder. Hey, Mike, when was the last time you saw the sun? Maybe you can go outside for 10 minutes and check on your corn um, because, yeah, I can do a lot of good sitting at a computer 24 seven. But if I can't sit at a computer four hours a day because I've driven myself insane, uh, I can't help anybody. So, you know, even the simplest things of getting up and walking around once an hour for me is important for my health and by doing that it allows me to do more work uh, and continue not even do more work but to continue doing the work period um, and I, I have a, a great deal of respect for uh, for you and the organization for really focusing on that um, but speaking of volunteers uh, I'd like to sort of wrap up talking a bit about folks supporting Wildlife Rescue Society of Saskatchewan um, and you've got several types of volunteer positions, and I'd love if you want to kind of run through those quickly or if there's any specific ones. Um, I know we've already touched on transportation and the importance of that. Uh, and also that is arguably one of the easiest ones to get into because you drive and you put an animal in a carrier in a car and then you drive and then people who know what they're doing handle the animal. So you get to just be a cool part of the process. Oh, and you still get really good stories on it, too, as you said. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's still a hero position, believe me. <laughs> it's hero adjacent, we'll call it. Um, or even Alfred. Alfred was still a hero, right? He kept the Batmobile going. That's important. Oh, funny. Um, but, uh, you know, you've got helpline educator, rescue, event volunteers, and administrative, which is one of the ones that I, per, in my experience, can be the hardest to get good help at. It can be. We almost feel like a cult sometimes because if we get a <laughs> new volunteer who's really good and really keen, we jump on them so quickly to kind of bring them into the fold because uh, mm -hmm. we, we value them so much. Um, right now, we need marketing people, you know, it, we're animal people. We're not good at asking for money. We're not good at, we had an excellent grant writer, but she went and got pregnant and so she's not available. Um, we are looking really hard for, for our marketing person, a grant writer and on our board of directors, we, you know, it always starts at the top, Michael. And if at the top it's not cohesive and there's bickering, it filters down. And we have the yep. best board of directors led by our president, Rian Clark. And 
she is adamant the next person we need on that board and they have to be able to get along well with us is um, a fundraising marketing person that's that's what is key to you know we operate on a shoestring budget we're very fiscally mindful we look at every penny and uh, that that part we struggle with is the fundraising and marketing yeah it's uh it, it is a skill that typically gets developed outside of this Whereas almost everything else, uh, I'd say other than the accounting and legal, um, you can kind of learn on the go in a lot of volunteer positions. But there is a, a, a level of expertise required when you start blending those subjects. Um, so folks can, you know, there's always those opportunities. But of course, there's also membership and donations. And that is, I think, the great place to kind of land at. Um, you know, all of the stuff you're doing, 300 plus communities helped across the province, 5,000 plus emergency calls to the wildlife helpline, 200 plus species help, 220 volunteers across the province. It is a lot of work getting done. And while you rely on volunteers, you also need donations, right? It's the way the world works currently is uh, money makes everything possible. Um, if folks are interested in getting involved in that way via donation or, or membership of some kind, how would you recommend they go about it? Oh, come to our website, wrsos.org. We are always, always happy to um, discuss any of this with anyone if they wanted to call our helpline. We really hope sometime in the future that we'll find you know a business partner or a corporate sponsor um, an environmental business that's looking to support uh, a nonprofit like ours who does a huge service for the province. And we're always willing to discuss it. And as you say, donations are huge. And the nicest part for me of donations are the lovely notes that are sent to us by the donors. We get such yes. lovely comments. Yesterday alone, a lady wrote in saying, thank you for your heroic work. So that passing that along to our volunteers and they realize re how valued they are when they're spending all their own money doing this work that it really is appreciated. To learn more about Wildlife Rescue Society of Saskatchewan, visit wrsos.org. That's wrsos.org or find them on social media. Links to all of these are available in the show notes for this episode at defenderradio.com. I want to thank Bonnie for joining me and sharing her valuable time. I also want to thank you for listening. You can follow me directly on Instagram at Howie Michael and on Facebook under Defender Radio Podcast. You can also follow the Fur Bearers across social media networks. Until next time, I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio and the Fur Bearers, reminding you to stay informed and stay strong. <laughs>